welcome back to my channel, Health by Heather Hirsch, where we talk about all things menopause and midlife related. Today and also this week on the podcast, I wanted to talk about a topic that is often requested and hasn't been covered yet, which is thyroid conditions and how that interacts with menopause. So first, in this video, I'm gonna start by breaking down the two most common thyroid disorders, and then I'm gonna give you a couple of meaningful tips on how thyroid and menopause go hand in hand. So it's gonna be a really a good video. First, I wanna remind you guys, if you don't already follow me on Twitter, I'm at Heather Hirsch MD, and I post stuff there about my recent publications or any interviews that I do. I also am on Instagram at, at hormone.health.doc, uh, where I do a bunch of infographs, and so you guys can check those out. So I also have a podcast, which I alluded to, Women's Health by Heather Hirsch. I will link it down below, and I put out new episodes every Wednesday. Sometimes it's just with me, and sometimes I'm interviewing wonderful doctors and other experts in their women's health niche. So feel free to join me on any of those. All right, let's break down the most common uh, thyroid disorders. So first we're gonna start with hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism is that slow, sluggish, fatigue, weight gain, slowing metabolism uh, syndrome. Um, and that is often what's clinically seen if a patient has hypothyroidism. So what is hypothyroidism and what labs are you looking out for? All right, so hypothyroidism is when your thyroid stimulating hormone, or your TSH for short, which is the hormone that comes from your brain that goes to your thyroid gland, which sits in your neck, becomes really, really high, and your free or your active metabolites of thyroid, which are T3 and T4, become uh, very low. So your TSH is knocking on the door of your thyroid saying, Hi, no one's home. Why isn't there any thyroid in the bloodstream? Why isn't there any thyroid in the bloodstream? And keeps knocking and knocking and sends the reinforcements. That's why your TSH level gets really high and your T3 and your T4 get really low. So that's what happens in hypothyroidism. And those symptoms, slow, sluggish, fatigue, weight gain, uh, hair loss, hair thinning, cold intolerance, are some of the common things that we see with hypothyroidism. Now there's lots of really funny memes of angry cats and lions of, you know, uh, where people say, when I find out my TSH is normal. And the reason those are funny is because that constellation of symptoms is actually very common and a lot of women hope that if it is their thyroid that means that there is treatment uh, so that's why a thyroid is a very popular test um, and it is a very good screening test for any of those big symptoms hypothyroidism when it's autoimmune is called Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's is where you have the an autoantibody so your body's making an own protein which is attacking the thyroid gland and therefore not producing enough active T3 and T4 in your bloodstream, that's why you get hypothyroid. And again, that TSH is going up and up and up, screaming for that, for that uh, uh, active T3 and T4. So it can also be for other indications. People can be hypothyroid if they've had their uh, thyroid removed because of a benign or a precancerous or cancerous nodule, if they've had uh, radioactive iodine or, or which has destroyed some of the thyroid, that's gonna render it hypoactive and they're also gonna be on a supplement. So supplements that I will refer to very commonly are Synthroid or Levothyroxine. Uh, there's other ones. Some people take the active T3 and T4s, but for the majority, majority of women they're taking Synthroid or Levothyroxine. Now let's go to hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is the opposite. It's when you have that hyperactivity, maybe you start feeling heart palpitations, anxiety, irritability, heat intolerance, weight loss. That can be signs of hyperthyroidism. In hyperthyroidism, you're making plenty of T3 and T4, so much so that your TSH is like running away. Your TSH is really, really low in your lab work. And the T3 and T4 are really, really high. 
So hyperthyroidism, when it is an autoimmune condition, is called Graves' disease. It's a little bit more rare than hypothyroidism, but still is fairly common. It's treated differently um, with other medications or with medications to control the symptoms. So hypo and hyperthyroid are two different ends of the spectrum. And then of course there's benign nodules and goiters, uh, which after imaging, if they're ruled to be benign, sometimes, um, you know, we have, uh, your doctor will decide to remove it if it's compressing your neck it's causing a hoarseness or wheezing or any type of symptom that's affecting your quality of life and then finally there's a condition called thyroiditis so thyroiditis is an inflammation of your thyroid um, and a, a sub uh, diagnosis is postpartum thyroiditis and postpartum thyroiditis or thyroiditis in general are often thought to be viral or post viral or some kind of inflammation in which a patient will have initially symptoms of hyperthyroidism and then hypothyroidism and then start to level off and be normal so thyroiditis is also really common in fact i had a patient who had postpartum thyroiditis she uh was a, a couple of weeks post Postpartum was running around and feeling very anxious and losing weight and breastfeeding and didn't really notice it till she came to my office with palpitations, in which case we diagnosed her with um, uh, postpartum thyroiditis. Her TSH was really low and her T3 and T4 were really high. She didn't want to take any medications and so we monitored her and as I suspected, over the next few weeks she became hypothyroid. She was gaining her weight back and felt slow and sluggish and tired and her TSH was in the higher range. And then after a couple more weeks, it returned to normal. And so life was good. All right, so what do thyroid and perimenopause or menopause have to do with each other? Well, a lot, hence making this video. They actually have a lot to do with each other. First and foremost, they can mimic each other. So symptoms of hypothyroidism may be symptoms of low estrogen, which you could experience either postmenopausally or perimenopausally. And again, briefly, in perimenopause, your body is making some estrogen. As you're getting closer to your last menstrual period, you're making less and less. And so menopausal symptoms such as weight gain, brain fog, trouble sleeping, night sweats, you know, uh, slow sluggishness, those all can be confused with hypothyroidism because uh, hypothyroidism is just a little bit uh, uh, more sort of discussed or talked about or a doctor may be well more, much more informed on, on hypo or hyperthyroidism. So they can be confused with each other. So if you go back to that angry meme of the screaming cat when they find out their thyroid's normal, it may still be that there is a reason you're feeling this way and it may be perimenopause or menopause. So distinguishing one from the other is really helpful. In fact, when I see my patients for a consult, I almost always check a TSH because it's so easy and important that you don't miss that, right? It's easy to treat and it's important that you don't uh, confuse one for the other. So I almost routinely will check thyroid labs. So number one, they definitely can, can be confused for one another. Number two, fluctuating levels of estrogen in perimenopause can be a big frustration for women who already have hypothyroidism because those fluctuating estrogen levels will throw off their thyroid medication dose that they need to feel optimal. So I had a very lovely patient and she had been on 88 micrograms of Synthroid, a really common dose for the last 15 years. All of a sudden in her mid 40s, she was coming into the office feeling very slow and sluggish. And when we checked her TSH, which I'd like to optimally see around 2.5 in women, it was on the higher side, it was 4.5. Now that's still within the limits of normal, but I did adjust her Synthroid. I gave her a little bit more up to 100 and she started to feel better. And then two months later, she was having heart palpitations and we checked her TSH and it was too low again. So we had to lower that dose to 75 micrograms. So she was really frustrated and she said, why is this happening? I've had a normal Synthroid dose for the last 15 years. And it has to do with the fact that estrogen and thyroid, they vie and fight over the same proteins in your bloodstream to sort of drive around in. And when that estrogen is no longer a steady, stable dose, 
use uh, that can really throw off how much availability the thyroid medication has. So at, in perimenopause, as that estrogen is kind of, you know, going up and down and then going wonky and going down, it can really throw off your thyroid um, levels or the thyroid medication dose that you need to feel optimal. So that is an explanation for why many women have to alter their thyroid medication dose in perimenopause or at menopause which leads me into my next point is that anytime I start a patient on hormone therapy, be it in perimenopause or be it in menopause, I always recheck their TSH six to eight weeks later. In about one in 10 of my patients, sometimes one in 20, um, I will need to uh, dose, dose adjust their thyroid medication because I am giving them a little bit of estrogen replacement and that is throwing off their Synthroid dose. So if you have hypothyroidism, you're on a medication and you are thinking about starting hormone therapy, make sure your doctor is checking your TSH levels in a couple of weeks after that. Okay, so I wanna go back to another interesting point of how these can interact with each other. I mentioned at the beginning of this video that um, many of the thyroid conditions are autoimmune. And that is really important because there are there's one big menopause diagnosis that we believe to be highly autoimmune, which is premature ovarian insufficiency, or POI. It used to be called premature ovarian failure, but we no longer want to use that word. It's just inappropriate. So premature ovarian insufficiency is a menopause before age 40. And we really do believe that there is a large autoimmune component to, to this. And one really interesting fact is that where there's one autoimmune condition, there's sometimes other autoimmune conditions. For example, I very commonly find in my POI patients um, hypothyroidism. And I also want to give you a non-exhaustive list of some other autoimmune conditions that you and your doctor might want to be on the lookout for. Big ones are celiacs, and celiacs is where you're antibodies attack gluten if you eat it. Some people have a gluten um, adversity where gluten just annoys their system but doesn't necessarily cause inflammation like a gluten um, autoimmune condition or an allergy does, but celiacs is something important to take note of. Pernicious anemia is also when your body attacks um, your ability to absorb um, iron, and that's another um, big uh, autoimmune condition. There is uh, rheumatoid arthritis, there is lupus, uh, and other connective tissue um, conditions that are often also um, you, you know, lumped in with those autoimmune conditions. So where there's one autoimmune condition, there's often another. So if you do have premature ovarian insufficiency, do be on the lookout for some of these other autoimmune conditions and have your doctor also be thinking about these with you. And lastly, and most importantly, if you do have a thyroid condition and severe menopausal symptoms that are coexisting and going hand in hand and you're undertreated or mistreated, this can have some really deleterious effects on your health. For example, both hypothyroidism and menopause, when you lose your estrogen, can have really deleterious effects on your bones, causing you to have osteopenia or osteoporosis, in which case you have low, low bone mass or low bone density, which can really increase your risk or predisposure to a hip or a spine fracture, neither of which I think that you want. And also hypothyroidism and low estrogen in menopause can also worsen heart disease, particularly if you have something like premature ovarian insufficiency or early menopause and these things go undertreated or mistreated. So both of these definitely can have implications if you have symptoms that you can feel or even ones that you can't if they go undertreated or mistreated. So make sure you bring up any concerns that you have with your own doctor. I really want you to be proactive about your health so that you live your best life. All right, I hope this blurb on thyroid conditions and how it interferes with perimenopause and menopause was helpful. Please like and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my content. Uh, and also it lets me know that you like this type of material so that I will keep 
taking time to make more for you. Again, please make sure you follow me also on Twitter, on Instagram, and anywhere else that you get your social media. I love your feedback, and I really want to include more in what you guys want to learn about. So my mission is to empower women and expose and uh, rebuild the gaps in women's health care, particularly at menopause and midlife. So I hope this is helpful. I hope all of you are staying safe and staying well during these trying times. All right. See you again next week. Bye.